want that strong association between bed and sleep. So if there's things getting in the way of that, especially things that are work-related where you're getting your mind thinking about other stuff, the last thing I want you to do is be sitting in bed and thinking about like news and the state of the world and things that frustrate you. You know, on Facebook, seeing something that your racist uncle posted and that pisses you off, that's not going to help you sleep at all, right? So try to try to avoid things that weaken that association between bed and sleep. Hey everybody, before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist, and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice, and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 180. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people just like you. And today we're doing something a little bit different. Um, so there are a few episodes of the podcast that I consistently refer back to. You know, I'll be answering a question on a different episode and I'll say, you know, look at this episode for more information about, say, productivity tips or mindfulness or whatever. And some of them, like the one I'm going to be doing today, are so old that they get buried and they're really hard to find on things like Apple Podcasts or other podcast players. A lot of times they only show the most recent 100. And now that we're at 180, you know, there's a lot that are below that. So a few of these things I'm going to be redoing. I'm going to be either re-recording them or just re-releasing them depending on the situation. And by far, the most common thing that I refer back to is the episode about sleep. So back in episode 26 of the podcast. That was all the way back in September 7th, 2016, which is just crazy. I can't believe I've been doing this for so long. I was literally, I, I just got a haircut right now. And the guy was asking me about, you know, what I do and, you know, got to talking and mentioned the podcast. He's like, oh, is it a new show? And I'm like, actually, no, I think it's, it's been going for quite a while now. And so to have an episode from 2016 that I'm redoing now, it's just kind of weird and surreal. But yeah, sleep I talk about super often and it's something that I talk about in my clinical work, you know, on the podcast and even just in general life to people. A lot of times you'll you'll find me on my personal Facebook uh, sharing the sleep episode with people that I know in real life because they're talking about like, anybody know what I could do about my sleep? So it's something that I talk about a lot. Um, before I get into my discussion of the importance of sleep and my tips for getting better sleep, I want to point out another really great resource. So uh, Dr. Matthew Walker, he's a professor of neuroscience at UC Berkeley, and he specializes in sleep. He did a series of interviews on the Peter Atiyah drive. So uh, Peter Atiyah, he's a doctor, and he has a podcast where he talks about all sorts of things related to health, longevity. It's a really interesting show. Um, it can be a bit heady. They, they definitely go into detail in, in the episodes that, that he records with other doctors and such. Um, but the episodes he did with Matthew Walker, I think he did a series of three of them. The first one is episode 47 of the, the Peter Atiyah Drive. Um, they're, they're all about sleep, and they go way, way deeper than we're going to go here. But if you are a mental health professional, if you're um, even, you know, a neurologist, a neuroscientist, if you're, you know, in the field at all, or just somebody who wants to learn more about sleep in a deeper way, I would highly suggest those episodes because I learned a few things from them that I didn't already know. And they, they, they get into some really interesting stuff. So that's the Peter Ortia Drive. Uh, first one's episode 47, and it's with Matthew Walker. Definitely check those out if you're interested in going deeper. Anyway, let's go ahead and get into uh, this episode all about sleep. You know, sleep is massively important for a variety of issues. We know that already, but, you know, for one reason or another, people kind of really suck at sleep these days. It's not necessarily a new thing. I can remember being in, you know, high school, as early as high school, it's certainly college, and having people almost compete for how bad you can be at sleep. And social media, social media doesn't help that at all. You know, people are constantly talking about how sleep deprived they are. It's almost like this, the, the, the lack of sleep Olympics that happen. 
But, you know, even aside from that, it's just one of the most common complaints that I see in my clinical work, in my daily life. It's a big deal. And we'll talk more about why, but sleep is very, very important. All that's to say, you're not alone if you struggle with it. I used to be really bad at sleep myself. You know, in in college, I was terrible at it. In grad school, I had myself convinced that maybe I could just sleep every other day so I could be more productive and do more things that I enjoyed. And, you know, it would be common to see me, you know, uh, even online doing a live stream at like two or three in the morning and then waking up at like 6 a.m. to go uh, drive to school, which was stupid. But that was me back then. And now I'm actually pretty great at sleep. I, I don't struggle with insomnia. I rarely struggle with sleep maintenance, meaning staying asleep throughout the night. Um, it's it's much easier for me. It's something that I don't dread. I used to dread going to sleep. I really didn't like it. And now, you know, it's it's a normal thing. Uh, I enjoy it. So one thing that I found is that, you know, the amount of intervention you need to, you need to do is going to differ depending on how much you struggle and what exactly you struggle with. And one thing is that there's sort of like this barrier, you know, your, your body gets used to being in a rhythm. And if you're not sleeping well, your body gets used to not sleeping well. And that's sort of like the comfortable zone to be in. If you break through that and you get into a rhythm of sleeping really well, you can sort of back off on some of the rules and some of the the kind of strict things that I'm going to talk about here. And that's like where I am at right now. I've, I've kind of proven to my body that I'm able to sleep well, and I don't need to do all the stuff that I'm suggesting here because I'm not struggling with it anymore. But if I'm going through a period of time where, you know, I, I'm struggling more than usual, I go for, you know, months at a time of sleeping well, and then suddenly I'm having a hard time with waking up at night or getting to sleep, then that's when it's time to reinstitute some of those things and, and, and become a little bit more strict in the rules that you're applying to yourself related to sleep. So basically I'm saying address it when it's an issue, but sometimes when you break through that and you can kind of teach your body that you have the capability of sleeping well, you'll notice that things really open up a little bit. So why is sleep so important? There's, there's a lot of reasons why it is. Um, the first one that I want to talk about is actually memory. A lot of people don't know this, but there's this, there's this little structure in your brain called the hippocampus. Hippocampus just means seahorse in Greek. And it's because it kind of looks like a seahorse when you, when you take it out of the brain and put it on a, on a table, it looks like a little squiggly seahorse. Um, but that part of your brain is what's involved in memory consolidation, meaning you learn things throughout the day and it helps you to transfer those memories into your actual storage. Somebody with um, Alzheimer's disease, right? It's the most common form of dementia in older adults. Alzheimer's disease um, is a degenerative brain condition, and it and it interferes with the functioning of that hippocampus. And so that means that when people, someone with Alzheimer's disease uh, tries to learn something, it never makes it into their storage. So they truly don't have the ability to make new memories the way that they used to. That process of consolidating those memories that primarily happens while you're sleeping, while you're in sort of the deeper stages of sleep. So if you're getting adequate sleep, that's a good thing. That's actually helping your memory. If you're not, it can screw with your memory. And I see a lot of people in my line of work, which is um, I'm what's called a neuropsychologist. So I test people's memories for things like dementia, brain injuries, strokes, things like that. Um, I see a lot of people who have memory problems that are simply caused by the fact that they they do not get good sleep, whether it's uh, really, really severe sleep apnea, a sleep condition like narcolepsy, or, um, you know, other factors that are just preventing them from getting those deep levels of sleep and and REM sleep, which is that rapid eye movement sleep. Uh, When that happens, you can have it look like you have dementia. It can look like you have legitimate memory loss, but that's not the case. It's sort of a temporary issue that's caused by the fact that you're not allowing your brain to consolidate those memories and put things into storage. Now, if you're a student, if you're in a job where you have to kind of continually learn and take in more information, or if you're in sort of a period of, of like recovery or, you know, trying to make progress in your life. So say you're trying to Um, work on your anxiety. Say you're going to therapy, you're doing some self-help work. You're basically essentially trying to teach yourself and teach your brain new ways of, of, of approaching the world. Sleep is very important for that because you're trying to kind of learn new skills into, in order to integrate those skills, you need sleep. 
you can actually see in like, um, I've noticed this with my kids when they were younger, when they were infants and with uh, my puppy, you can see when they're in sleep and practicing things because you, you do sort of practice and rehearse information in your sleep. Like uh, if you have an infant, you've probably seen them sleep and kind of suckle. That's actually them practicing. And you can see them, you know, do certain motor movements that are actually them practicing those motor movements in their sleep because they're trying to learn them. So sleep is really, really important for memory, really, really important for skill building. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. Okay, today's episode is brought to you by Creating Better Days, and they are a perfect sponsor for this episode because they make CBD products. We've all heard of CBD by now, probably. It's also known as cannabidiol. It's derived from the hemp plant, and it's one component of marijuana, but by itself, it's not the part that makes you high, and it doesn't appear to have very significant abuse potential or addiction potential. There's still a lot to be discovered about CBD, but the research that's there right now, and of course, many, many, many personal accounts suggest that it's great for helping relieve stress and helping people sleep. It also appears to help with pain and inflammation as well. Uh, personally, I use CBD sometimes to help with sleep. It's another option along with things like melatonin. Definitely talk to your doctor before you integrate anything new into your regimen, but it's something that you can use if that's an issue for you. And then my wife uses CBD products extensively to help her with pain, sleep, anxiety, and nausea. And they help her quite a bit, more than some of the prescription medications that she's been prescribed. So personally, I feel that CBD is very helpful. It is certainly overextended in some cases. So talk with your doctor, do some trial and error in an appropriate way and see what the good uses are for you. But it's an option that's out there and it's really great. Now, Creating Better Days is a really cool company because they have a wide variety of CBD products available. They sent us a package that had gummies, tinctures that are like basically liquids with a dropper that you can put under your tongue. And they even have capsules that you can take like pills, like any other supplement. Uh, one unique aspect that really makes Creating Better Days one of the better CBD product uh, developers out there is that they batch test all their products and they use a third party lab to do so. So each product that you get has a QR code. That's one of those little square barcode looking things. And you can look it up and see the lab analysis through an independent party to see exactly what you're getting in each batch of the product, which is good because CBD is pretty unregulated right now. And sometimes you get some wacky stuff. They also use a unique process to help with rapid absorption of the product, so they affect more quickly. They offer multiple options with CBD and full-spectrum products, so there's a lot of different options for you to choose from, and they even offer a specialty line for pets. So if you're interested in integrating CBD into your life, I can definitely suggest trying out Creating Better Days. They're offering the listeners of the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast a special offer. Use the promo code SELFHELP, all one word, SELFHELP, for 20% off your first purchase. Just go to creatingbetterdays.com and use the promo code SELFHELP during checkout. The other thing that's related to mental health is that having, say, anxiety, depression, or, or a variety of other mental health issue, issues, certainly bipolar, borderline these things are exhausting, you know, and they take a lot of they take a lot of energy out of you. For things that are kind of on the depressive spectrum, you also can struggle with motivation and feeling lethargic and feeling like you don't have any energy to do anything. So when you add lack of sleep on top of that, it makes it a lot harder to deal with, you know? Like imagine you're in the scenario where you have depression and you're trying to do some things about it. You're trying to maybe take walks during the day or you're trying to uh, pick up new hobbies. You're trying to uh, do things that are productive and things that will get you moving. If you have a lack of sleep and you're feeling really low energy because you simply aren't getting adequate rest at night, you're not rejuvenated the next day, that's going to kind of compound that and it's going to make it harder for you, even you know, on top of the lack of motivation you already have, to do these things that are going to help you pull out of that depression. So sleep is really important to kind of continue that fight. And, you know, certainly with anxiety, I like to think of it as like basically processing the world twice every moment. You know, you're processing the world through the same sort of eyes that everybody does. And then you're also adding this layer of anxiety on top of it where you're interpreting the things that you're worried about, the things you're fearful might happen, the things that you feel like you maybe need to plan for. All of that is on top of sort of the normal processing of trying to be sort of a regular, in air quotes, person. So a lot of that is mentally exhausting. So of course you need sleep to try to rejuvenate and recover and get back to it the next day because this stuff is hard to deal with. And, you know, of course, lack of sleep makes everything more difficult. It compounds the other issues and makes them more difficult to deal with. 
Now, there are a variety of physical health issues that are associated with poor sleep. I don't need to go into them there. I'm sure you're you're familiar with some of them. But one thing that I was unaware of until I listened to these these podcast episodes I was talking about at the beginning with Matthew Walker is that um, there's a really interesting process that happens in your brain. So your brain has a variety of different cells in them. And we have these cells in there called glial cells. Glial essentially is meaning like glue. And the way we've thought of these cells for a long time is that they're basically just the glue that holds the brain together. They're just structural cells. They don't really do anything, but they're there to make sure that your brain isn't just like a mushy, gelatinous nothing. It actually has a shape to it. And what we've found is that there's actually a process that happens, again, during these deep stages of sleep where those glial cells shrink back and provide little channels for your cerebrospinal fluid, this, the fluid that goes throughout your brain and your spine. Um, it, it, it actually shrinks back and provides these channels for that to go and clear out some debris. In your brain, I'm not going to get into too much detail, but you have these things called uh, plaques and tangles, neurofibrillary tangles. And um, those are basically byproducts of cells dying off. And anybody's going to have a little bit of them. But when you have a lot of them, those are associated with issues like Alzheimer's disease or other dementia conditions. Certainly brain injuries can also cause that. And so when you get that those deep levels of sleep, that sort of, uh, they call it glymphatic. So we know of the, the lymphatic system, a cute name for the glial cell version is the glymphatic system. Those channels open up, that fluid comes through and washes out some of those tangles, some of those plaques and those nasty things that could build up in your brain. So that it's a kind of a natural process that reduces your risk of developing something like a dementia condition. But of course, if you're not getting any sleep, not only does it screw with your memory, but you continue the buildup of those things, which puts you at risk of some sort of degenerative condition taking hold. So again, another reason that deep sleep is really important. Um, and the last thing I'll say about the importance of it, because I'm sure I've have you convinced already that you need to look at your sleep a little bit more closely is just that it's not the number of hours, right? You can be in bed for 10 hours, but if you're getting really shitty sleep during that time, you know, if you're not getting down into those deeper levels of sleep, where you're getting that rest and that restorative sleep, where you're having that memory consolidation and that glymphatic drainage, um, that's not going to count as much. You're still going to be fatigued. You're not going to get the benefits of sleep if you're not able to get down into those deeper levels. So just consider that when you're, when you're picturing the whole deal related to your sleep. So let's talk a little bit now about um, sort of what you can do to get better sleep. The behaviors associated with good sleep or related to getting better sleep are what we call sleep hygiene. So if you hear somebody talk about having good sleep hygiene, that means that you have behaviors that are you know normally associated with getting better sleep. And there's a few solid tips that that will likely make your sleep better. They're they're effective, and you know if you stick to them, they're they're going to work. But you really need to follow the advice. You know, a lot of people I see online, you know, when I talk about sleep and sleep tips, I, I've certainly done videos and, of course, my other podcast episode about this. I see people share, retweet, and, you know, support the stuff that I write that's related to sleep, but then they don't actually practice it. And I can tell this because I'm a creep and I can see what you do online. You know, I see you at 3 a.m. saying, oh, God, you know, I wish I could sleep, but X, Y, Z, or, you know, back on the insomnia train and all these things. Uh, and I also see that happening when you're in bed and you're on your phone and not following my advice. So don't mean to be a creeper here, but don't be stubborn. You know, if you're having a hard time with sleep, stick to the things that I'm talking about here that I'm going to be telling you about and don't be stubborn with it. Back off from it when you're doing fine, when you don't need the help, but don't say that you have trouble with sleep if you're not trying some of these things out. All right. So the name of the game when it comes to getting better sleep is association. Association is a term that we use to describe the process by which your brain basically pairs two things together. This is very related to classical conditioning. I'm sure you've heard of classical conditioning before. Maybe not by that name. Um, if you're a psychology student, you certainly have. But even if you're not, um, the, the really popular experiment was uh, Pavlov, you know, Pavlov's dogs. So you have a natural reaction that happens. So you have a dog and you present them with a food powder, essentially. And the natural reaction is that those dogs are going to salivate. They're going to start drooling. Certainly, I've seen this with my new puppy recently. She is a drooler and a half. Oh, my God. But that's a natural reaction that happens. You don't need to train anything for that to happen. But then you pair that, you know, presenting the food, you pair that with something that's unassociated. 
right? So it's not yet associated. In this case, they used a bell or like a, a tone of some kind. And over time, when you present the food, but also play that bell or that tone, the dog is going to start to associate the tone with the food. And those are, those are first unassociated, but then they associate them together. They link them in their mind. And then once you build that association, you can play that tone or that bell and that'll gener generate the, you know, salivation without any food there. Um, again, you know, my puppy is like this because uh, if it comes to around 10 or 11 o'clock at night and I open the pantry, she comes running out of the bedroom because she thinks I'm going to be getting her one of her little, you know, dog biscuits to put her to bed in her crate. So she has that really strong association between opening the door, crinkling a bag, and then eventually getting that, that biscuit. So she's made that association, even though sometimes I'm just getting myself a snack or something like that, and I'm not ready to put her to bed yet. So, you know, with sleep, we want you to have a strong association in your body um, between certain behaviors that you're going to do and the process of going to sleep. You want to build that association. So therefore, a lot of these tips really, really focus on consistency, keeping things consistent and building that association over time. Uh, on that note, the first tip I have is to have a very consistent routine prior to bed. So a very, very consistent bedtime routine. If you've ever sleep trained a kid, right? If you've ever tried to get a kid to, to get better and better at falling asleep on their own, you've seen how important this is. You know, maybe you have your own kind of routine where you do a bath and you maybe rub lotion on them. You read a book, you turn off the light, you turn on a noise machine and put them to bed. And you do that same routine over and over night after night. And they start to associate that routine with going to sleep. You know, once you start the routine, they start getting sleepy, they get sleepier, sleepier. And then by the time you do that last thing, they're ready to go to bed. And that's a very helpful tool when you're trying to sleep train a kid. Well, you want to do that to yourself as well. You want to have a pretty consistent routine, whatever it is. Uh, and what I would say is definitely at least the very last part, make it make it very similar. So like for me, uh, you know, part of my bedtime routine, and this isn't going to be the same for everybody is actually like doing dishes. I'm going to be cleaning up the last things in the kitchen before I come in, brush my teeth, you know, take out my contacts, do all that thing, and then crawl into bed. Um, you, there are other things that you might integrate in there as well. What I would say is that probably even though like waking up and going to sleep at a similar time are very helpful. That's, that's another tip that I'm going to say here is that you know, as much as you can, having a consistent sleep and wake time is important. I think that's kind of common knowledge, right? You know, your body gets used to going to sleep at a certain time, waking up at a certain time, and the more you can keep that steady, the better you're going to be. But I would say that probably even more important than that is making sure you have, you know, a really effective bedtime routine and a consistent routine. And if it's something that's a little bit uh, portable, that's, that's helpful too. For instance, if you're in a hotel or a different place, However much you can do of that bedtime routine, it's going to help you get sleep in this different location, even though you're not in your bed, even though you're in a different place. If you can still do some of this routine prior to bed, your body's going to go, oh, okay, I'm getting that signal that it's time to start getting sleepy. So it could be really anything. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about some things that we might want to integrate in there. But, um, you know, I think that you could even get away with some what you might call bad sleep behaviors if you do them in the same way every night and keep it consistent. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. All right, today's episode is brought to you by Warby Parker. You've probably heard of them before. They make eyeglasses. Warby Parker was founded as a collaboration between a few close friends, and their idea was to provide an alternate to the overpriced and sometimes bland eyewear available today. So their whole ethos is that prescription eyewear shouldn't cost the same as like a plane ticket. So they give high quality, good looking prescription eyewear at a fraction of the price. Their aesthetic is vintage inspired with the contemporary twist and every pair is custom fit with anti-reflective polycarbonate prescription lenses. One of the awesome things about Warby Parker is that they partner with nonprofits like Vision Spring to ensure that for every pair of glasses sold, a pair is distributed to somebody in need because a lot of the world does not have adequate access to prescription eyewear. So my wife went through the process of doing the try on at home program through Warby Parker. It's really easy. Basically you go, you take a quiz, answer a few quick questions, and they'll suggest some great styles to you that are personalized to fit your face and your style. If you have an iPhone X or newer, you can download the Warby Parker app and do a visual virtual try on. So you can see what the eyeglasses actually look like on you with the realistic color, texture, and size of each style with just your phone. 
So with the try on program, you order five pairs of glasses and try them on for five days. There's no obligation to buy them or anything like that. They ship free and they have a free return label that's already prepaid. So you're able to try them on, show them off on social media, ask your family and friends about them. And then when you pick one that you want to get, you ship them back and let them know which one and you'll be able to get that pair for a great price. There are a variety of ways to submit your prescription for the glasses. You can enter it directly into the website at checkout. You can email a picture of it or they can contact your doctor and they can go ahead and, and find the prescription for you. And a few extra fun points, they have sunglasses as well, starting at $95 with polarized lenses with prescription. Uh, they also have blue light filtering lenses that are available now. One of my wife's uh, glasses that she got has the blue light filtering and they look fine. You know, they look like normal glasses. You can see a slight tint to them, but she really likes the way they do filter out that light and they look really nice. So if you're interested in getting some new glasses, definitely check out Warby Parker, head over to warbyparker.com slash duff and Warby is W-A-R-B-Y. So warbyparker.com slash duff and get the free home try on kit. And you can take the quiz to find some pairs that would be perfect for you today. So for instance, um, at certain points in time, I've used the iPad in bed and a lot of people say, oh, well, don't use any sort of devices at night. You know, you get the, that sort of light that's going to be, you know, activating your brain and not letting you sleep. And, you know, I have mixed feelings about the research on that. I'm not convinced about that, but either way, if, you know, the way that I've used it in the past, and I'm not doing this right now, but I've like, for instance, played puzzle games or, um, crosswords or something like that in bed on the iPad and doing it that way every night and only using the iPad for that reason um, when I'm, you know, playing that game, for instance, or, or doing those crosswords when I'm going to sleep, my body builds that association between actually using the device and going to sleep. Uh, you could do the same thing with like, you know, uh, mobile gaming if you're using a Nintendo Switch or something like that, reading, whatever, all these things on their own may not be the best behaviors to help you sleep, but if you're doing it the same way every night, you can train your body to expect that. And even in some cases, it's like, you know, if you uh, do a certain thing, like play a certain game or whatever it is that's associated with sleep during the day, you might realize you're actually getting a little sleepy. You're getting a little relaxed. So you can train yourself to become tired while doing these things. But again, you know, I, I want to repeat what I said at the beginning, which is be as strict as you need to. Once you kind of establish that you're, you're sleeping better, you can loosen up on some of these things. You can get away with some of these more, you know, bad sleep behaviors. But if it's not working, tighten up and tighten up as much as you can to, to sort of follow the rules more strictly. Um, you know, and, and don't force anything that's, that's not working for you. If you want to be the type of person that can use the iPad in bed, but it turns out that, yeah, it just does affect you. It keeps you up. It gets you sort of more activated and you're not able to sleep because your thoughts are racing or whatever, then don't do it. You know, it, that may not work for you and that's okay. You got to try something else. So if that's not the case, try a different option, but whatever you do, you know, when it's, when it comes to, you know, um, relaxing before bed the way you go through your bedtime routine of cleaning up and you know you getting your body ready all those different things try to keep it as consistent as possible in the same order with the same sorts of things because that's going to train your body to expect sleep after that sort of sequence finishes so another tip uh, that focuses on association and conditioning actually has to do with your bed so we're, we're going back to sort of the pavlov's dogs here right um a, a bed doesn't naturally mean sleep. So what I mean is, you know, you take a newborn baby and you put them in a big comfy bed, that's not necessarily going to be more associated with sleep than a bassinet or a pillow on the ground or something like that. Certainly, you know, not hurting your body is helpful for sleep. And so having something comfy helps. But um, the, the notion of, of like a bed is something that we've really sort of trained ourselves to expect over time. And if you go to different parts of the world, beds might look different. You know, some people use sort of like a very thin bed roll. And to somebody who is maybe from, you know, the United States, that might sound really uncomfortable. And they expect a big king size fluffy bed or something like that. And it all comes down to whatever you're training yourself to expect and whatever you associate with sleep. So one thing that we want to do is we really want to associate the location of bed with sleep. And in order to do that really strongly, you need to avoid doing things that are not sleep focused in bed, right? So ideally, the only things that you do in bed are sleep and things that are like 
you know, sexual activities, having sex, masturbating, whatever, because those are also things you want to associate with your bed, probably. Um, so ideally, though, you're not doing anything other than those things in bed. Naturally, sometimes that, that may not be the case, but if you're having a hard time sleeping, this is one of the first things to look at. Are you sitting in bed and using your laptop? Are you spending a lot of time on your phone in bed? Are you reading in bed? Are you watching TV in bed? Are you doing, you know, um, homework or, you know, um, in my case, you know, one of the things I might have done is like score assessments in bed, things that are related to work or play or things that are just not relaxing and not sleep focused. The more you do those in bed, the more you're weakening that association between sleep and bed. And so we want to try to not do that. A lot of people, um, you know, do other things in bed. A lot of people have TVs in the room and they watch TV in bed. Again, if it works for you, it works for you. If you're having trouble sleeping, that's one thing that you might want to cut out. You can still watch TV or read or do any of these things prior to bed. But what I would suggest is do them somewhere else, right? So like a, one of my suggestions to people very often is, yeah, you watch your TV, you read your book, you do whatever, but, you know, give yourself a comfy chair that's not in bed. You do it there until you get super tired and then you go to bed to sleep. And that's what bed's for is to go there and sleep, not go there and do other stuff. But again, you know, it, this is all balancing act. If you're finding that the routine of getting in bed, opening up that book, reading a few pages, like kind of lulls you to sleep and it works out great, then fine, do that. But you have options here. And, and ideally you want that strong association between bed and sleep. So if there's things getting in the way of that, especially things that are work-related where you're getting your mind thinking about other stuff, the last thing I want you to do is be sitting in bed and thinking about like news and the state of the world and things that frustrate you. You know, on Facebook, seeing something that your racist uncle posted and that pisses you off, that's not going to help you sleep at all, right? So try to, try to avoid things that weaken that association between bed and sleep. You really want to try to keep your nighttime sacred overall. You know, you want to keep the world out of your nighttime routine. So give yourself a chance to have this buffer where you're getting away from the world, you're focusing more inward, you're focusing on relaxation, getting disconnected. And the whole point here is to recharge your batteries. You know, you want to rest and rejuvenate and get back to the world the next day. But for this period of time, you know, the rest of the world has no place in your bedroom. You just need to be able to be there and go to sleep, rest, get your body ready to get back to it the next day. So therefore, time to get on my soapbox, get your phone out of the bedroom. Now, if you're the kind of person that's not having any trouble with sleep, this isn't going to apply to you, as I've said a million times. But so many of you have your phone in the bedroom for reasons that have nothing to do with sleep, and it's screwing with your sleep. You don't need it in there. Technically, you don't need it in there. You know, some people will say, oh, well, I have an alarm. I, you know, I use it for my alarm clock. They still make alarm clocks. You know, you could you could use something else. I mean, even a good compromise is like if you have an Apple Watch or something like that, an extra device, you can use that as your alarm clock instead. Um, but, you know, for me, I just have like a regular old uh, digital alarm clock across the room. And I put it across the room because I'm a snoozer. So I have to wake up and walk across the room to hit it. But, um, you know, you can use a regular alarm clock. Other people will say, well, what if there's an emergency and somebody needs to contact me? You know, what if there's a fire or something like that? Well, there's different options for that. Like I said, if you have like a wearable device, like a, like a smartwatch, a lot of times you can take calls and make texts on there, but you're not necessarily going to do that, you know, naturally if you're given the chance, but in an emergency situation, it could work. Um, another option is to get sort of a, a really cheap prepaid phone, you know, like kind of one of those little burner phones, a flip phone that you can get at the drugstore and just load a few minutes on there and give that number as an emergency number only to people that you want to have it. So parents or loved ones that you want to have that, then you give them that number and you can keep that in your room, but you're not going to use it unless it's an emergency, right? So there's different things that you can do to work around some of these common objections, but you know, in general, you don't need a phone in your bedroom. The chances is, is way too high that it's going to amp you up or ruin your night. You know, like I said, you want to unplug, you want to rejuvenate. And if your phone is the last thing you see before going to bed and the first thing you see when you wake up, and even, you know, some people keep their notifications on too. So like you're, you're sort of laying in bed and you hear, bzz, bzz, and then you naturally turn over to go make sure it's not something you need to address. That's not going to help you get good sleep. That's not going to help you get into those deep levels of sleep. Again, remember, it's not just the hours of time in bed that count. It's the quality of that sleep. So, you know, if you're laying in bed 
and you're sort of on notice, like you're, you're not able to fully relax because you're just waiting for something to happen on your phone, that's tough. You know, certainly there are some people that can't get away with this, people who are maybe on call as doctors, people who are maybe, you know, emergency service people, plumbers, et cetera, that like they have to have their phone nearby just in case there's a call. And that sucks. That's that's going to be hard. And you need to find a different way to work around that and, and do these other things I'm talking about to, to maximize your sleep. Um, but if you're not like that, if you're not sort of an emergency technician of some kind, you likely don't need to be having any sort of interaction with the outside world while you're trying to sleep. So, you know, do your best to keep the phone out of your bedroom unless you're being very responsible with it, unless you're putting it in airplane mode and listening to an audio book before you go to bed or doing something that's really integrated into your sleep routine, but avoiding the outside world coming in and interfering with your sleep. You know, I don't want you to, if you don't have any self-control and you're not able to avoid, you know, going to Facebook and email one more time and refreshing before you go to bed or checking the news or Twitter one more time before you go to bed, that's the news, all the things that are happening in the world, unless they're an immediate emergency that's going to affect you right now, they can wait till tomorrow. You know, nothing you're going to do in this, in this moment of time while you're trying to go to sleep is going to change what's happening outside your bedroom in the rest of the world. You're better to catch up, uh, you know, about it tomorrow, the next day when you're feeling more rested, when you're feeling more clear headed, you don't need it to ruin your sleep. Okay. So stepping off my soapbox now, let's try to keep the stress of the world outside of the bedroom. Let's not have it interfere with sleep. A big part of that for many people is getting the phone out of the bedroom. Another way that you could do that, if you know, do whatever works for you. But um, if you're if you're really really convinced that you need your phone nearby, at least put it outside the room. You know, get a little shelf or a little table and put it outside the door so that you know if somebody does call you, you can hear it. But you're not going to go reach over and check Facebook while you should be sleeping or something like that. Um, I, you know, I, I talked about kind of keeping the nighttime sacred and having this this sort of routine. What I think is helpful is having sort of a wind down period. So, you know, an hour to 30 minutes before bed is ideal, however much time you can carve out. And even before the the immediate sleep routine of like brushing teeth and doing all of that, it can be helpful to just sort of unplug from the world half an hour to an hour before bed and start to calm down, start to sort of sort of shed the stress of the day, disconnect from the world and start to transition into sleep and rest mode. Um, you know, so you check your phone one last time and then leave it alone. You know, you can do it. You log off social media, get off of those things. Just do it one last time and then leave it alone. And then, you know, do some things that are related to resting. You could do some stretching or foam rolling, you know, yoga. You could uh, even watch a little bit of TV if you want to or read, listen to some music, um, you know, do some arts and crafts if you're into that kind of thing, play with your dog, whatever it is, do some things that are restful. I also think that journaling is something that fits really well during this period of time. Um, if you're the type of person to get into bed and have a lot of thoughts in your brain and you have a hard time sleeping because you're sort of like problem solving or thinking about things that you need to do the next day, things that you need to keep track of, all of that, I mean, that's a real thing. You know, your brain does. If, if you haven't really resolved some things, your brain will hold on to them and try to work them out during your sleep, which which makes it really hard to stay asleep at night. So if you give yourself a chance to just sort of upload it onto the paper, right? So get it, get it, get a paper out or journal, whatever format works for you. It could be as structured or unstructured as you want, but just write down some of the things, whether it's things you need to make sure you address tomorrow, things that you're, you're worried about, things that you're happy about, just get some of those ideas down on paper so that you don't take them into bed and rehearse them while you're trying to sleep. Now, one, one quick note about that is that um, for the journaling, Often what I would say is do that as early as possible in your bedtime routine or in this sort of wind down period, because sometimes like, let's imagine that you're laying in bed and you have it on your bedside stand and you write down a bunch of things you're worried about and then close your eyes and try to go to sleep immediately after that, that, that time, like not having any buffer, just going straight from journal to bed, that can kind of be a little bit counterproductive sometimes for certain people where that actually gets you thinking about the things that you're worried about. So instead, you know, doing it at the beginning of this 30 minutes or at the beginning of this hour, writing that stuff down and then letting it go and focusing on trying to transition into more sleep and rest, that's going to be more helpful for a lot of people. So 
something to think about. You know, you want to do something that's that's relaxing and, and not too mentally stimulating and trying to be disconnected as much as you can. Um, and then, you know, from there, so with this sort of perfect bedtime routine, you, you spend that, you, you, you journal, you spend the rest of that hour doing relaxing things. Then you transition into that very consistent sleep routine that I was talking about, getting ready in the same order, you know, doing things in the same location and really telling your body, okay, it's time to get tired. It's time to get ready for bed and then getting into bed and going to sleep. So once you go to sleep, uh, sometimes people have a fine time falling asleep, but the issue is that maybe they wake up um, or they lay in bed and sleep just doesn't come at all. So if you're having trouble sleeping, one thing we want to try to not do is fight a battle with sleep, right? I don't know if you've ever noticed, but it's really hard when you try harder to sleep, to sleep, like when you go, oh, just sleep. Okay, ready? One, two, three, go. That's not going to happen, right? And the more you worry about whether you're sleeping or not, you're like, okay, how long has it been? It's been five minutes. It's been 20 minutes. It's been an hour. That can really take you out of that restful mode by worrying about sleep. So if you find that you're fighting a battle with sleep, you know, you've been in bed for over 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, whatever it is, whatever is a long time for you, what I would say is that try, try it again. Try to do it over again. So rather than just staying in bed and trying harder to sleep, get out of bed. So get out of bed. Because you don't want to associate stress with bed, right? You don't want to stress yourself out and be in bed where you should be focusing on relaxation. So get out of bed. Um, stay disconnected. You know, don't don't go hop on Facebook and all that stuff like I mentioned. But get out of bed. Go, you know, grab yourself a glass of water. You know, um, in some cases, people might need a snack, you know, a handful of nuts or something like that. Whatever is going to fit for you and, and what your body needs. Um, you know, you could do a little bit of reading or a crossword puzzle or simply just, you know, lay on the couch and look at the stars, whatever it is, get out of bed, do something that's relaxing for a few minutes, 10 minutes, maybe five, 10 minutes, and then go try again, get back into bed. And this isn't a continuation of that battle you were fighting before. This is you starting over saying, okay, I, I kind of reset. Let's go try to go to sleep again. So don't fight that battle, get out of bed, do something different, and then try it again. And you can do this multiple times in a night. You know, you can do this more than once if you need to, because it's going to be better, right? Like it's going to be better for you to get out of bed and do something that's enjoyable and relaxing rather than staying in bed and fighting that and getting more and more stressed out. You know, even if you're in bed for less hours, but you're allowing yourself to get a higher quality sleep because you're relaxed and happy, that's going to be better than if you stay in bed for 10 hours straight, but you're just like pissed off and, and, and frustrated that you're not able to sleep and worrying about how tired you're going to be the next morning. So it's just something to consider. Um, we're starting to get to the end here. I, a few more things to, to mention. Um, so exercise, right? Uh, exercise is something that can be very, very helpful related to sleep. Uh, for many people, Heavy exercise right before sleep isn't always a good idea because it gets your body elevated, you know, your heart rate's going, it perks you up rather than calming you down. But getting more exercise during the day is something that definitely is associated with getting better sleep. And also, if you're somebody who doesn't get a lot of sunshine, um, the body has, there, there's, there's something called melatonin. You've probably heard of it before. You can take melatonin supplements to help with sleep as well. But melatonin is a substance that, that that builds up in your body, and once it passes a certain threshold, it signals your body that it's time to sleep. And so um, there are a lot of things naturally that help that buildup happen. One of them is being outside. So seeing the sun actually start to go down is something that helps your body, you know, kind of kind of kickstart that melatonin cascade that's going to eventually make you sleepy. And so if you're the kind of person that has an inside job and you're not really spending a lot of time outdoors, especially in the evening, that might be something to consider. So getting more exercise early on during the day, that's going to help you be more tired at night. And then in the evening time, if you're having a lot of trouble sleeping and just not getting tired, maybe spend the evening around sunset time actually outside in nature, you know, backyard, front porch, whatever the case may be for you. And allow yourself to kind of watch that sunset and get your biological, just strictly the biological part of, of your body, that's kind of redundant and, and dumb to say, but hopefully you know what I mean. You know, we're just trying to inter, inter, intervene on the biological side here. Um, get your body starting to produce that melatonin. And so that when you go through the rest of these other things we're talking about, your body's actually ready to start getting sleepy. Um, caffeine. You want to watch out for that. It, it does affect you, even if you feel like it doesn't have much of an effect on you. It does. It may you may be able to still be tired. You may 
um, feel like, you know, you can drink two double espressos and go straight to sleep, or there's a variety of different things that people say. But the, the, the fact of the matter is physiologically, it changes the way that your body is working. You know, nobody's immune to caffeine. You can certainly have different levels of tolerance, and some people have interesting effects that happen from it. But it's still affecting you, right? And so we want to be careful with having caffeine in the later afternoon because it can certainly affect you going to sleep. It also affects anxiety. You know, a lot of the effects that caffeine and other stimulants have on your body look very, very similar to the effects that anxiety has when you're having sort of physiological anxiety, raising heart rate, you know, increased muscle tension, um, all the things that kind of happen with a fight or flight reaction, caffeine sort of just gives it a nudge in that direction. So be careful with that, you know, when it, when it comes to one, two, three o'clock in the afternoon, maybe reconsider having that extra, you know, coffee or monster or whatever the heck it is that you're, that you're drinking for caffeine, even tea, you know, that sort of thing. Just be careful with that because that can affect you when you try to go to sleep later on. And then of course, if you're, you know, uh, if you have other people that live with you, you know, family members, loved ones, spouses, children, whatever, and you have important things to talk about maybe try not to have these monumental, huge, life-changing conversations right before bed for the same reason that, you know, (laughs) journaling is important. You don't want to take all this crazy, swirling information and thoughts in your brain and then try to sleep with that going on. So table those for the next day or do them earlier on in the day if you can. I'll I'll say a quick note about, you know, substances and things like that. So uh, melatonin is a a good supplement. You know, it sort of artificially kickstarts that process and helps signal to your body that you should be sleeping. Um, There are are very little side effects. I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm not going to give you like a legit recommendation about this. You can do your own research about it. You can talk to your doctor about it. But in general, melatonin is, is pretty well tolerated and it's something that does seem to help for people. Um, CBD products, it, we, we talked about that recently. So CBD being the, um, the compound in marijuana that's not psychoactive, so it doesn't make you high. That has been associated with, with getting better sleep as well. Um, the research is still young on that, but it does seem to be something that has very little addiction potential. So the risk is pretty low in trying that out. But again, talk to your doctor before doing anything like that. Um, there are other substances, of course, things like alcohol or sleep medication, such as Ambien. Now, those are good for putting you to sleep, but they don't help you get the right kind of sleep. In those uh, the, those episodes that I talked about with Matthew Walker, I, I think it's with him at least, he says something to the effect of, you know, like medications like Ambien are like a baseball bat to the head. I can hit you with a baseball bat and that will make you unconscious. That doesn't mean you're sleeping, right? If you get knocked out, you're definitely not awake, but you're still not getting restful sleep. And that's what a lot of these things do. Um, certainly alcohol is not as bad as like, you know, Ambien or something like that when it comes to, you know, really, really disrupting the type of sleep that you get, but it's not good either. So, uh, you know, as with everything else I've said, you can look at the whole picture and see where you might be able to become a little bit more strict with your sleep hygiene. You don't need to change everything about what you do, but the more trouble you're having, the more you should change. So... I think that's kind of about it. I feel like I've, I've been, you know, kind of jamming through these, but, um, that's pretty much what I have for you with regard to tips that will help you get better sleep. So we've talked about, you know, why sleep is important, having to do with memory, you know, helping with uh, the fight against mental illness, the, the, the drainage that happens in your brain when you get those deep levels of sleep. Uh, we talked about, you know, good sleep hygiene being related to consistency and association, having a consistent bedtime routine, avoiding non-sleep activities in bed, not fighting those, those battles with sleep, um, getting outside, getting some, getting some exposure to the sunset to sort of start that melatonin cascade, exercising earlier in the day, uh, getting your thoughts on paper so you don't bring them into bed. Talked about a lot of stuff here. So hopefully some of these tips are, are good for you and helpful for you. And I'll just reiterate that, you know, sometimes what it takes is getting really strict with this to prove to yourself that you're not somebody that sucks at sleeping. And once you could break through that barrier, you can kind of ease up on a few things. And again, you can kind of get away with some of the more bad sleep behaviors if you do them in a way that's consistent and is intentionally restful. So hopefully that helps. If you have any additional questions, just hit me up. You know, you can shoot an email to deaththepsych at gmail.com. 
You can find me on social media at Depth of Psych on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Shoot me a message and I'd be happy to try to answer any other questions you have about sleep. And then if you feel like this would be helpful for other people to hear, if you have people in your life that are struggling with sleep or you just want to share it broadly, please do. You know, you can link to this episode, depthofpsych.com slash episode 180, or you can share the iTunes link or whatever and just get the information out there because a lot of people could really, really use it. Thank you guys. Really appreciate you. Um, I will see you for the next episode and I hope that you have a great rest of your week. Bye.